I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to this presentation this afternoon. So as Johan said, um, I am the founder and um, person at uh, Chapters Interior. So we've got a couple of divisions to our business. Two of the big ones are the project side of our business. So we've been doing a projects a business, a commercial and residential for a good couple of years in South Africa, um, as well as our training side of the business. And quite recently, um, three years ago, we, we branched out into Shanghai, China, and we are doing some projects here at the moment. And I'm actually based in China, uh, sort of involuntarily. So I came here to do my, my international certification as a as a trainer and managed to get myself stuck in lockdown. So um, thankfully, this uh, a lot of our training can be done online. So that's what we've been doing in China. Uh, um, uh, in the time that we've been here, but also working with clients. So as Johan said, we've been working with the, the Etteltal group for at least four or five years, and we do quite a lot of brands within the ITD group um, in terms of teaching their, their customers, uh, their staff to have a better informed conversation with clients. So teaching them about the principles of design. Um, and what we do with uh, very uh, thankfully and enjoyably with uh, Etteltal is a couple of times a year we do some really interesting presentations around trends, about what's going on in the world, what they should be looking out for, uh, you know, what uh, what um, the buying trends are, are globally and all of those sorts of things. And when, when they approached me about this presentation, I said, let's not do your ordinary what happened in 2021, what's coming in 2022 presentation. Let's actually have a look at something really topical, which is what has design, what, what has COVID done to the world of design? Because COVID really did change everything. So we all we were all impacted by COVID in a number of ways, whether it was family, friends, lockdown, our businesses, all of those sorts of things. But in terms of the world of design, uh, COVID has had quite a big impact. And I'm going to start this presentation and I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm going to touch on fashion, makeup, hair and things like restaurants, because those are all sort of fit into our, our worlds in terms of architecture and interior designs and the world of self-expression. And then I'm going to look at a little bit uh, more detail in terms of architecture and interiors and what COVID has done to those. And then later on, I'm going to talk to you about the trends that COVID is pushing. So they might have been trends that were starting to come about or things we never expected. But COVID has really changed those things and made them part of our everyday lives. OK, so I'm going to start with fashion. And um, before I carry on, I'm going to tell you that Nicole from Etteltal is on standby. She is watching the chat box for me. So if you have any questions at any stage during this presentation, please drop them in the chat box uh, and she will moderate for me and tell me to stop talking at some point. Uh, and answer a question. Alternatively, we, we can wait until the end. Your other alternative is you are very welcome to get hold of Nicole at Etteltal uh, on email after this uh, session and ask her questions, and I'm very happy to answer them from then. And also, just to let you know, we've got quite a lot to go. We've got an hour, so I'm going to go through things quite quickly. I'm not going to uh, belabor any points. I'm going to jump from thing to thing quite quickly. But if there's anything you want to ask at any point, please just wave your your little hand, and Nicole will will give me a shout to to stop speaking and uh, gives me a chance to have a, a sip of water and to answer your questions. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in, and I'm going to start with fashion. So COVID changed the consumer's relationship with clothes. You know, we had this very sort of buy and give away or buy and throw away kind of culture in the last couple of decades around fashion and clothing. So COVID, through many uh, circumstances, and, and you can imagine what they are, we started buying fewer garments, fewer clothes. So revenues dropped by a third, by at least 33% in 2020, which is the equivalent of about $640 billion in lost sales. That is the kind of impact that COVID had on fashion. So purchases of sweats, 
or things like loungewear. You'll see I'll refer to loungewear in, in the next slide. The really sort of casual look, those increased by 80% and Google searches for the garment sweats or leisure wear hit a 14 year high during our biggest lockdown periods. So part of the reason that this casual movement from this sort of three piece suit that we see here on the right hand side to something a little bit more casual, but still quite structured, is casual, casualness was already starting to take its place um, uh, earlier on than when um, the pandemic happened. We'd started to move more towards a, a casual look. So we can see we can see the shift in what is termed as or, or termed as appropriate in office wear from our suits of the 90s to more sort of the if I could call them khakis of the two, uh, the 2000s and going forwards. So in in recent years, some workers, particularly young white men, in the creative or tech industries, think Facebook, think Elon Musk, those sort of tech industries, they've really felt comfortable wearing hoodies or joggers to work. So if these historical examples are something to follow, then we can expect fashion as we come off, see a message there, sorry, I'm going to ignore it. We, we're gonna see coming out of COVID, the, the trend that was starting to happen, the thing that uh, the COVID did to it and coming out of that, we're going to be still quite casual coming out of COVID. And you've seen a lot of this sort of thing in magazines and publications and online at the moment. So how to wear, how to wear lounge wear, wear to my measure wear, uh, the best measure wear brand. So you've seen a lot of this sort of thing. And we're buying a lot of casual, casual and comfy clothes that we buy. So like pajamas, how many of us during COVID presented either in tracksuit pants, pajamas or loungewear and never told anybody. And most notably things like sweatpants. So the, the, and here's another example in terms of men's fashion, the athleisure capsule wardrobe. So the pandemic upended the argument that the, that big changes in terms of sustainability in fashion takes time because the fashion industry is one of the biggest bugbears in terms of the sustainability movement. It is very ungreen in terms of an industry. So industry experts have always said that we can't force consumers to change their behavior and we can't count on government to provide support for those industries. But have a look at what the pandemic did. So it reduced the number of uh, items that we buy. It created a stronger sense of the, um, the capsule wardrobe. And it's very likely to affect how fashion plays out going uh, into the next few years. And it's very possible that consumers are going to adjust to owning fewer clothes. The next one is in terms of makeup and this. So I've picked these topics because they're all forms of self-expression as our, our interior spaces, whether they're residential or commercial. So makeup underwent quite a hammering and a transition through COVID as well. So what happened is the lockdown expedited trends that were already starting to happen in the makeup space. So people were starting to take a different approach to makeup from the very sort of contoured Instagram glamorous upon Melanie sorry we just lost you there for a minute when do you where do you want me to go back to no that's um there where well, you started talking about the lip gloss Okay, so this slide. Yeah, there we go. Okay, Perfect. Okay, cool. Okay, so Johan, if I can ask you, if I lose signal, just give me a, a shot and then I'll just reverse it. It's like rewinding me. Perfect, not a problem. Good. Okay, so the lockdown expedited the trends that were already starting to happen in this kind of space, in the, in the makeup okay. space. Melanie, we can't see your screen now, your slides. Like a biggie? You see, let me unshare with you. Don't you love modern technology? Okay, can you see it now? Yes, we can no. see it now. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, and present of you? No, it's your full program. Sorry, everybody, give us one moment.
Mm -mm. Hold on, hold on, hold on. One moment, please. While our operators are currently busy, okay, let me stop sharing and we'll start from scratch. Okay, let me get a present of you. Okay, better. Can you see? Present of you? Yeah, that's better. Thanks, Melanie. Okay. Okay. So what happened is there were makeup trends already starting to happen, but the lockdown that we had last year and, and the coming waves and the and the subsequent lockdowns that we've had around the world is the lockdown expedited things that were already happening in the space. So people were starting to take a different approach to makeup and moving away from that very sort of Instagram or Instaglam type of layer upon layer kind of makeup that we've come out of in, in the last couple of years. So, Richa, we, Richa, Sorry, I'm going to stop you there. We can see your slide notes. She needs to click right and click on the show presenter view. I am. I am on presenter view. Hold on. Okay, let me share my presentation with you. Trends. Presenter view is this one. We just go here, presenter view. How about now? That's perfect. Thanks, Mel. Nobody move. <laughs> okay, so researchers have predicted that some of the trends that have come out of COVID uh, are going to stick around. And our cosmetic bags, gentlemen, pay attention here, are going to get smaller as women are starting to abandon things like lip pencil, contouring brushes and contouring sticks, and all that sort of blending technique stuff that was popularized by the, the Kardashians. And they, we're going to switch to easier to use multi-purpose products such as tinted moisturizer and lip balms. And for all the women on this call, you will know that how little you've used lipstick in the last 18 months to two years uh, because it gets on your mask and your face is continually covered. So you don't actually need to use as much makeup as you used to. But one of the interesting things that happened in the makeup space is like furniture and like clothing, a lot of beauty sales went online. Almost 40% of beauty sales in 2020, uh, in 2020 were online, which is almost double of 2019's levels. The other interesting thing that happened is we started to merge the real life experience with the digital experience. And in early 2021, John Lewis, if you know the UK, you will know the, the, the store John Lewis, and a lady called Charlotte Tilbury, she's a, a makeup artist, they broke the Guinness World Record titles for the la world's largest beauty masterclass. 10,000 people signed up to a class, something called br to brush along at home, to create a specific uh, 90s supermodel inspired look. And what she did, uh, this makeup artist, Charlotte Tilbury, is she shared a lot of her A-list beauty secrets and created one of her very famous looks all online and people could brush along at home and she broke the world records. So we're starting to see a merge of real life experience and, and almost AI or digital experiences happening in a retail space. Hairstyles have also been affected. Anybody who was in massive lockdown, you will know that your hair grew out, your color grew out. We started dyeing the, our own hair color. People moved to gray. So with the big lockdowns that we had, People were not getting haircuts at all or trying to cut their own hair and potentially <clears throat> messing it up. No names mentioned. But what we're going to see is almost a shift in the hairdressing industry where people are going to learn from a skills point of view some very basic trimming techniques, for example, from their local hairstylist. And then maybe a, a, a trip to the hairdresser once or uh, twice a year for something a little bit more advanced in terms of techniques. So the hairdressing space is changing as well. So a lot more infrequent salon visits 
and virtual in, uh, in, instruction from, from hair stylists is going to be the norm. And hair trends during lockdown uh, were low maintenance. We went gray, we went fuzzy, we went long bands, uh, we went pixie cuts, our, our, our long grown out hair. And anything you read at the moment will be about the trend of going gray. So a lot of women, as well as men, embracing their grayness all the way from 20 year olds all the way to 60 year olds people used to dye their hair quite a lot they've embraced going gray and it's this massive massive trend at the moment that you're seeing coming out of the pandemic so going moving on to our interiors and our, our architecture so as the interior design magazine said in 2020 we all really rewriting the playbook as we go none of us are really know what's going on and what's coming our way so everything is changing post pandemic and it's about being conscious of the changes and why the changes are happening and riding the peak of that wave okay so the pandemic changed how we work how we learn and how we interact as social distancing, the guidelines, all of those sorts of things, both personally and professionally in terms of the spaces that we work, live and play in. So before I move on to how those things change, I just want to touch on trends and fads. So there's quite a big difference between a trend, a fad, a micro trend uh, and a macro trend and something that's called a mega trend. So a fad is something that comes in and out. It's quite quick. So the best example I can think of is something like the fidget spinner. So suddenly every child on the planet had a fidget and some adults had a fidget spinner. So it's it happens very quickly. It's like a flash flood. Sorry, George. Um, it's wildly uh, 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 taken up. Very often it's in an age group or a culture or a social group, and it comes in and out of fashion quite quickly. Trends, however, tend to be a little bit more slow paced. So there's something that sort of grows and they happen on a much wider scale. You'll have a fad might come in and out within six months to a year. You get something called a micro trend, which basically lasts from about three to five years. A macro trend, a micro trend will become a macro trend if it has the sustainability to make it that long. So a, a macro trend is something like social media that has lasted more than sort of five to 10 years and keeps on growing. And then of course you get something called a mega trend. And a mega trend is something that starts becoming part of our fabric of society and how we live every day. And a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today, they've started out as micro trends, moving into macro trends, and a lot of them are going to change the way our society is structured and they're going to become mega trends driven uh, primarily through COVID. So one of the first things was everybody started to work from home in terms of lockdown measures. And in fact, now, if you read a lot of the, the publications around the world, there's a lot of resistance to going back to working in an office full time because the majority of us have proved that our jobs can be done offline or remotely or in a hybrid way. And in some instances, we actually uh, as productive, if not more productive than we used to be. So in central business districts, think of, for example, Santon in Gauteng. Uh, you know, large office buildings and skyscrapers sat deserted. And even if a portion of people have gone back now, a large portion of that space is still very unoccupied. So work is now being done remotely. Some businesses are starting to reevaluate the need for such big, spacious and expensive bottom line kind of spaces. So there's going to need to be long term adjustments to business location strategies, how our businesses operate. So the idea of putting 7,000 people in, a, in one building Monday uh, to Friday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. is going to be a thing of the past because the, the, the pandemic has proved that we can actually do differently. And according to a recent McKinsey uh, study, they found that 20 to 25 percent of workforces in advanced economies can work from home between three and five days a week. And that is going to change 
our, our commercial spaces footprint as well as our commercial spaces design and how we use them. So it's not as easy as 25, 75, 90% of your workforce suddenly working from home. There's other factors included in that. So remote working is definitely going to cut costs for large businesses and offices that have these expansive buildings. But we need to bear in mind that the absence of those large scale businesses can be detrimental to your surrounding businesses, your sandwich shops, your coffee shops, your local grocers, your, your Ubers, anything that is dependent on those large scale uh, business footprints for business. So we need, to, we need to be thinking long term in terms of relocation of buildings in central business uh, districts, incorporating these businesses into that strategy. So the other thing that's going to uh, uh, take place and it's already happening is new forms of public space. So anybody who was locked down in a tiny apartment of uh, 40 squares and had two children with home learning, you will know what, what this was about. So the way we design public spaces is going to need to change post pandemic, along with how we prioritize them in our urban areas. So we all know that there's been this very big uptick in terms of awareness, as well as interest in biophilic design. So as the, the pandemic has converted people into full-time pedestrians or cyclists, our spaces are becoming some of the few outside resources of leisure activity outside the home that we can use. So it's going to become really, really important going forward how we consider our, our city spaces incorporating public space. And I wanted to include this example for you because I, I thought it was just so clever. So it's also, it's not just about access to, to outdoor spaces. Coming out of the pandemic, it's also about how we keep those spaces safe um, in future pandemics, for example, or future outbreaks of the current pandemic. So an architect studio firm in Austria called Studio Precht, they unveiled this idea uh, for a park. And, and as you can see, if, it, you, if you see the diagrams and the, the, the design of it, it looks like a fingerprint. So it's for a park that's orientated to main social distancing while, pe while people are able to stay outdoors. So, for example, if you look at this, um, if you go and you research this project, it's a maze, but it's been done in a fingerprint pattern, which is sort of a bringing together of humanity and nature all together in the in the same sort of space. But they've also created social distancing uh, via the use of hedges, the, the maze. And also there's little spots all the way along the maze, if you lost, that you can sit down and enjoy the greenery. So in future emergencies and future pandemics, because we now are the thinking that this won't be the last of uh, the pandemics. Our ice caps are melting and there's an enormous a lot, uh, amount of viruses um, in those kind of spaces, uh, in that kind of ice that's going to lead to future pandemics. These are going to be very important spaces of refuge and serenity going forward in urban spaces. So new restaurant layouts is, is, is a really tricky one. So we went from restaurants to absolutely no restaurants to uh, blocked off seating to different strategies of how we maintained a business while maintaining social distancing. We've got mandatory temperature checks at, entrance to, at entrances and most restaurants are following social distancing. Seating is limited, seating spaced out to keep us away from each other, which kind of defeats the objective of a restaurant. But worldwide, there's been so many different clever ideas in terms of how we maintain social distancing. So anything from the little greenhouse design to the drop down the plexiglass design. This was my favorite, the bumper car uh, bar that they did. And one of the strangest things I've seen is here in China, they have these massive teddy bears. Uh, I think they buy them from Costco and they pop them into the seats here that you can see where the crosses are. So you sit and you have lunch or dinner with a massive teddy bear, but it prevents other people from, from sitting in that space. But going forward now that restaurants are starting to open, we're having to rethink the way we lay out our restaurants. So 
Traditionally, we used to divide up spaces by different floor finishes or different surface finishes. Now, you know, we, we initially put in things like uh, plastic sheeting or plastic guards. Those are not really sustainable. They, they look dirty and they, they attract grease and all of those sorts of things. We need to be finding clever ways to separate our restaurants, either with outdoors or booths or uh, dividing our spaces up cleverly with plants. Okay, so restaurants, restaurants, as we know, are, are about to change. Then one of the other big things that happened out of COVID was adaptive reuse. So it, it was around before we, we were hit with the pandemic, but it's really taken on its own legs and run since the pandemic. So, and I'm going to give you such a lovely example now of, of the way companies are starting to do this. So it's all about the process of using existing structures to serve new purposes. So think Bramfontein, where people have taken old factory buildings and they've converted them into uh, young upcoming uh, one bedroom or studio apartments. So it's efficient, it's sustainable, it's creating new spaces, particularly in aging cities. So along with the, the trend of modular construction, it's proving to be very effective in creating emergency facilities around the world. As pandemic um, uh, waves have happened, we've had to use this quite a lot. So this is the one example, is our, our apartments in Bramfontein. This one you will know, anybody from, from Cape Town, this is the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art. And this was carved out of the, the unused grain silo. So the silo was decommissioned in 2001. And it was a it, it stood almost as a monument to uh, a Cape Town's industrial park. And at one time, it was one of the tallest buildings in South Africa. And it's now been given a new life through the transformation into an art gallery through a, a design studio called Heatherwick Studio. And this is the example that I mentioned earlier. I think it's such a clever example. So a lot of particularly you hear about it in America, we might start seeing it, you, you're definitely seeing it in China, you might start seeing it in South Africa sooner rather than later, is where shopping malls are starting to die. So what happened in the States is a Macy's department store was closed in 2018. And what happened is um, the school, which was called Burlington High School, in their existing schooling property, they discovered toxic levels of industrial chemicals uh, known, as, known as PCBs. They found them in the soil, which made the, the, the building uninhabitable, uninhabitable. And what happened is the students were then at home online learning for at least six months, So, which for students is not a lot of fun. So what happened is they took over a Macy's department store. And the conversion project it took 10 weeks and you'll see now why it took 10 weeks and it why it was so quick. And it had a budget of about $10 million. And what they did is they did this state-supported retrofit in, inside the, the shopping mall. They added partial walls for classrooms. They kept <clears throat> some of Macy's remnants like their white floor tiles, bright red carpeting, Calvin Klein and uh, Michael Kors kind of signs and this large Levi's jeans photo. This is actually in a classroom and you can see that the desks are socially distanced. The library in the school is now housed in the former Macy's China department. And while the not yet finished gym is being created in the former warehouse and the perfume counter was transformed into a, li a library and the kids loved it. They describe it as weird but cool. And it's such a clever idea on how we can use spaces to our best advantage with a little bit of creativity. The other thing that's come out of COVID was uh, lightweight modular construction and architecture. So since the, the onset of the pandemic, many companies have started to develop various architecture and design solutions that address that need for emergency solutions. And it was very obvious at the time that that was the greatest need. We need emergency hospitals for, for COVID patients. So a lot of them were tent type structures built as almost like field army hospitals and test centers. And as uh, health centers around the world were overwhelmed, 
the demand for more facilities such as hospitals, quarantine centers, testing sites, places that you, you could quarantine or temporary lodgings, it's never been as high as it is now. So given the demand, modular construction is becoming increasingly common. And being in China, I was actually here for the massive outbreak in, in Wuhan. And I saw this project happening live and it was one of the most fascinating things I've ever watched was the development of Wuhan Hospital. So Wuhan, they opened, but they, they not just built, but opened a thousand bed hospital in 10 days, 10 days. And they followed with a second hospital in less than two weeks after construction started. And the reason they were able to do it was down to modular design. And why were the, so, the Chinese so adept at modular design? because they'd done it before. They'd done it as part of a SARS virus outbreak in 2003. And they had the skills and they had the knowledge and they had the equipment and that's how they managed to do it so quickly. A thousand beds in 10 days is remarkable. The other thing that's starting to happen a lot is flexible building design. And this comes back to my, my comment around, you know, the 7,000, uh, 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 staff sitting in one building. You know, a lot of companies, they need to expand and contract depending on who's in the space, what you're doing with that space, what their business is, where they are in a pandemic, what time of the year they are. So something, a, a new type of sort of architectural thinking called shapeshifters has, has popped out during the, the pandemic. It's not a new concept, but the importance of adaptability became increasingly evident during the pandemic. And so creating things like emergency makeshift facilities like we've just seen to reorganizing our homes so that it's better suited to working remotely, homeschooling, flexible design is proving to be very essential. So this is an interesting project. This is called The Shed, if nobody knows. This is in New York, uh, in, in Manhattan. Um, and in five minutes, this building doubles its uh, size in terms of its venue size. So if you have a look at this outer shell here, this either slides backwards or forwards in terms of the space that you need. So it's called the shed. Its concept was really simple. Sorry, hold on. It's a 120 foot building that just moves according to what they needed to do. So it was an architectural hallmark and it's a metaphor for the, for the future of culture. So it, it was a half a billion dollar project it's a hybrid museum sort of meets performance space, and it can shape shift according to what they're doing. So if it's just a museum, the, the, the shell is back on its uh, wheels. And in terms of if they need Ed Sheeran to perform that night, the whole, she the whole shell moves out and doubles the space within five minutes. And here's a really interesting example in terms of um, uh, shape shifting in terms of res residential spaces. And I do have to apologize the copy, the copy on this is quite small. I'm going to read it to you. But this was a shape-shifting residential concept developed by an Australian uh, architectural firm called Woods Bagot. And this is called the ADAPT system. So what it is, it's a series of screens and walls that are used to segment an open plan space. So here's our big open plan space that you can see here. And these are our screens and walls here, these, these shaded bits that you can see, and those are movable. And the same concept is available for office spaces, but you get a day mode and you get a night mode and you get a weekend and evening mode. So a day mode, what happens is the configuration, you can move the walls and the dividers around to create generous living and dining spaces, separate kitchen, a little bit of workspace, anything you need during day hours. Night mode, anything from 7 p.m. Uh, to later, you shift your dividers around and it allows for more of a living room, uh, a main bedroom, quite a substantial main bedroom, a generous second bedroom if you need one, a study, all of those sorts of things. And then your third configuration that you've got here is called play mode. And this is on weekends and uh, later on evenings if necessary. So it transforms into, you shift your, your screens around and it transforms into a large open plan space for entertainment, meetings, 
group classes, yoga, Pilates, whatever your requirement is, as required. So already we're starting to see these sorts of things happening in commercial and residential spaces. Okay, so that's a little bit of what COVID is starting to push for us. And what I want to talk about next is how we're learning to live the new normal, the new normal as everybody says. So how are we going to live with COVID going forward? So the future of interior design will reflect the reality of the world, of our world, it always has. But our world has been changed a lot by, by COVID. We need to incorporate cleanliness and materials. We need to stop disease. We need floor plans like we've just looked at that are movable. We've got home a lot more homebound activities than there used to be, as well as there's a very big focus on personal well-being and health. And interior designers, as well as homeowners, are beginning to embrace a new way of living that, that means spending more time at home and thus creating uh, spaces and refuges from the outside world that for two years has been quite threatening uh, in all honesty. So we've had to revise our home working models. So the crisis proved, as we, as we discussed earlier, um, to companies that we can work at home and that people are, are actually have better well-being as well as it being a, a really sustainable choice in terms of CO2 emissions and, and those sorts of things. So we're seeing a lot more dedicated workspaces in homes, real home offices, you know, not just those sort of places that we pay the bills and look up a recipe on, on the side counter uh, in the kitchen, but spaces uh, that uh, we spend a lot of time in, we have a lot of space, it's separated from the house, we can be uh, uh, productive, but there's a very clear distinction or separation between our working space and ours and our relaxing space and ours. So anybody who's in the comfortable office furniture, good lighting, efficient storage, excuse me, kind of industry at the moment, you're in for a win because those are on rising demand. So home offices are souped up with large work surfaces, comfortable task chairs, uh, storage spaces, everything for much heavier use. And for those of us who have smaller spaces, anybody who's in the multifunctional furniture field, this is your time. So drop down desks, stylish office furniture that doubles as decor, all of those things are going to be important. The other thing that's going to be important, of course, is soundproofing. And we've all had this experience. Sorry, hold on, let me get my slide to move which it's not. Okay, come on. Sorry, hold on a second. Let me change that, presenter mode. No, nope. this one, view. Interview. Okay, we're back. Oh, there we go. Okay, soundproofing. So we're starting, we've been doing activities over the last two years at home that require new solutions. So anybody who's had a Zoom call, an MS Teams call, had to listen to their children, have online classes, you know, all of those, we've discovered we actually need a little bit more in terms of soundproofing solutions. So soundproofing happened a lot in uh, commercial workspaces or your more office kind of environment, but we're starting to see it happen much more in uh, our home spaces. So staying in quarantine for, for a couple of weeks, you know, with kids and a lot of family and husband and wife working from home, we also are starting to reconsider the concept of privacy. So that leads into, you know, we having to start to be really clever about the way we partition. So most of our daily lives have been combined to, to homes and having uh, separate spaces for specific purposes or flexible spaces that we can use for multiple purposes are becoming really important. Um, you know, we've historically, we've gone from closed floor plans to open floor plans to hybrid floor plans. Now we're starting to have to think a little bit about hybrids with screen walls or clever dividers that help us divide our spaces up for different uh, uses, flexible use. So we need to be creative and flexible about how we go about that 
as we saw in that woods bagot um, design with the with the partitions that the adapt uh, system that we can move around quite a lot. So remote learning with school with school transi um, transitioning to online learning to back again to online learning. You know, having multiple designated workspaces in a home is becoming really essential to reduce distraction for, for everybody. So whether it is a room converted to a home office or a remote learning nook uh, within a larger area, client needs for clear workspaces is happening for everybody in the household from oldest to youngest. On that note, foyers and entrance halls, so suddenly when COVID happened, what we started to do was pay a lot more attention to sanitary areas, clear divisions between the outdoors and the indoors. And, you know, of course, foyers and entrance halls are not new in terms of residential or office spaces, but we started to see a new emphasis on these sort of things. So a place that we can drop the germs, whether it be our gloves, our mask, our clothing, in some instances, our shoes, and uh, almost sterilize and then go into a safe space with our families. So foyers and entrance halls are starting to become really, really important and much more functional. You know, and there was always that little bit of an awkward moment before COVID when you said to people, would you mind taking your shoes off? Whereas now it's actually quite common to say to people, would you mind taking your shoes off? And then you can come in barefoot or, or in your socks. So our entrance spaces are starting to change. Our private spaces are, are starting to change. So for families isolating together, you know, spending more and more time under uh, one roof doing different activities from gym to school to yoga to meditation to, to, to working parents, you know, everybody needs a degree of private space where they can spend some time alone. And being what used to happen is we used to be scattered all around our cities during the day and then reconvene in our, our dining spaces overnight. Now what happens is we all confine to the, the same space together. So people are starting to look uh, to carve out little spaces for themselves to maintain productivity, to maintain mental health and sanity from morning to night. So, for example, it might be in a commercial space where you have a pod like this or this is actually in a dressing room, a real quiet space that you can escape to so that you can refocus, um, kids can read, you know, it, it just gives you that safe space away from our very open plan spaces that we have at the moment. On that note, hotel inspired amenities are seeing a massive trend upwards. So <clears throat> since travel and vacation plans were largely put on hold or now are very expensive to do if you have to sit in COVID, uh, in, in quarantine for, for two weeks paying for it yourself, or flight prices have become so incredibly expensive. Homeowners in the higher brackets are looking for ways to make, to bring that hotel inspired travel kind of feeling into their living spaces. So making it feel a little bit like a spa or a retreat. So it might be a gym, it might be a massage room, it might be a sauna. You know, people are starting to prioritize bathrooms and places for relaxation and they're taking their cues from, from the world of hospitality and they're bringing hospitality into their own spaces. With uh, restaurants and bars and all our other venues uh, and the regulations that are really tricky to navigate and I can't have a table for 20 and we all need to sit a, a meter apart from each other, you know, if not your favorite restaurant having been shut down altogether, our homes and our backyards have become almost community hubs for our loved ones, whether it be close family and friends, where we can hang out safely uh, at a socially responsible distance, we can experience the outdoors, you know, and outdoor living. And in South Africa, we are particularly blessed in uh, that we have a climate that we can do this in. So our home outdoor living spaces fill a void in terms of um, the outdoor experiences that we've been denied over the last 18 months to two years. And it's become a safer option for our families and friends to gather in our own spaces because we can control the cleanliness and the hygiene and the social distancing and all of those sorts of things. So you're going to see 
big investment or demand for outdoor entertainment areas. And I know I'm not the only person on this call. I can count, it's an, I'm now up to two hands of the number of people, uh, friends and colleagues I know that have moved out of uh, city centers. Uh, for example, I have a friend who, she used to work in downtown Santon. She's moved to Plettenberg Bay and she now does her job from Plettenberg Bay and goes for a walk on the beach every morning and, and evening. So a lot of people are starting to move out of cities and demanding more space to be able to, to provide outdoor entertainment areas. Antibacterial materials. So when when COVID happening happened and we were all doing our part and disinfecting and social distancing and all those sort of things, we suddenly started to notice how many uh, details in our houses or our offices or our apartments that you hadn't actually really thought of before and that you actually touch every day. And how do you keep those things clean? So people have become a lot more conscious of materials that are a lot more sterile than other options and that can be used in design and will become a lot more popular going forward. So for example, you get antimicrobial uh, anti paint that has been developed by NASA. It's still in a testing phase. They, they're using it mainly only for commercial uh, use at the, at the moment, but give it a good five, 10 years, it'll be uh, residential as well. And that paint is resistant to, to mold, to fungus, to bacteria, even after repeated cleanings. Other materials such as our brasses, our coppers, our bronzes, our sort of naturally sourced um, warm metals, those are naturally antimicrobial. And the, the intrinsic pro uh, property of those materials is to destroy a, a wide range of microorganisms. So COVID is a virus and uh, viruses and bacteria function differently, but it's better to be safe than sorry and include things that are antifungal, antimicrobial, antibacterial in your spaces, as well as being aware of uh, viruses like COVID. So something like quartz, which was already uh, quite popular pre-COVID, it's, it's, as we know, it's one of the hardest non-pressure stones on earth. And uh, quartz countertops are hard, they stain resistant, scratch resistant, and that makes them one of the most sanitary materials because nothing gets into those scratches or those cracks that you get in other materials. Woods like your bamboo, these two are bamboos, I love this, this combination of black natural color and this white bamboo. Your, your bamboo, your oak, your corks, while being sustainable, uh, uh, material uh, uh, finishes and good for the planet. They're also really good at stopping uh, bacteria, microorganisms from growing, and also things like continuous surfaces, which used to be very popular in hospitals, in operating rooms. You're seeing those come through in uh, more residential or small office spaces, like countertops. You know, when it goes uh, from the counter all the way up uh, behind your your cooking area to prevent uh, germs or bacteria gathering in the cracks or uh, in any of the, the little dark clean corners, uh, the dark dirty corners. And of course, your terrazzos, your epoxies and your linoleums are all good options as well. Interesting from a fabric point of view, so in terms of fabrics, one of the things that we want to avoid with fabrics is the growth of mold and mildews. And the best way to do that is things like fabrics that include, uh, that have a degree of uh, acrylic in them or polyolefin or polypropylene. And for those of you who have experience in textiles, you'll recognize those names. They're, those are outdoor textiles. And traditionally, outdoor textiles were really dull and boring. And they all looked like they belonged to the beach. But these um, fibers, acrylic, polyolefin, and polypropylene are starting to appear in indoor fabrics. They're very easy to clean, and they are what we call hydrophobic. So they resist water, which means that they resist mold and mildews, which is going to make them safer in the long run. Then there's something called embracing Nixon. I'm all for this one. So Nixon is a Dutch word that is translated into doing nothing. And historically, used for um, to create mindfulness or wellness or to deal with burnout um, and uh, a lot of people used it to become a lot more creative. 
during COVID, what okay. happened was we all slow down and do nothing for the, especially that first lockdown that we had. So there were many, many moments of doing nothing other than baking sourdough bread and banana bread. But what ha what's happened is we have a culture and a, a, a sense of guilt because we have this cult of productivity that happens in our massive consumer design, uh, 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 um, society. But what has happened is COVID has forced us to embrace Nixon and appreciate the Ah, thank you. So what's happened as a result of Nixon, so we were told to do nothing, we did nothing other than uh, bake banana bread. And it's, it's, a, it's a real concept called Nixon. But what has happened out of Nixon is sanctuary-like spaces inside our homes as well as in our working spaces have become a trend. You know, thinking, for example, those small relaxing reading corners in the sun or that small little garden furniture at the bottom of the garden away from everybody else. So uh, this is one trend I'm all for is embracing something called Nixon. <clears throat> then there is voice control and easy to use technologies. So smart homes and vocal control were always around. You know, they, the, the Alexas of the world, uh, all of that was happening. But before, before we didn't need to touch certain surfaces, we all really thought, you know, smart technologies were something that made our lives easier and our houses a, a little bit cooler. Now we're starting to consider how technology can help us not touch doorknobs, not touch entrance uh, um, handles, uh, entrance ways of our, especially if we live in a flat or apartment building, or the buttons of an elevator. Anybody else doing buttons with their elbows? And so it's one of the reasons that vocal control is becoming a really huge trend at the moment. The other plus side to this from a design point of view is for people alone who live alone, it can be a really, really helpful solution if they need help or they sick, for example, a diabetic or somebody who has a stroke. And also, um, especially seniors, the, they, if they have a crisis, um, we can use technology, uh, but we can integrate digital media inside our homes to help elderly and people who are living alone. So it's starting to become more of a necessity than a gimmick. Then new spaces for new functions. So one of the th things that was accelerated by, by the pandemic was online shopping. We all suddenly realized how much online shopping we could do from food to groceries to firewood to, to beers and, and wine when we could. And this meant home delivery. So our, our houses or our offices haven't traditionally been designed to have a space to receive uh, online deliveries or something that's delivered, for example, by a drone. You know, So we're going to start seeing spaces, uh, office, uh, commercial and residential spaces where uh, deliveries, whether it be by drone or by uh, uh, Uber Eats or whatever the case may be, where we can deliver those things in a, in a safe environment, but also where we can unpack those things. So we don't want to bring the packaging from outside and whoever's touched it and what it's touched into our clean uh, antiviral spaces. So also we're going to look, be seeing spaces that are multifunctional, where I can unpack it, recycle it, and bring my goods inside without having to actually bring any germs into the space as well. And interestingly, one of the companies um, uh, testing drone deliveries in this manner is Nespresso Coffee. I'm all for having my coffee delivered. Okay, so we're also learning that less is more and local is better. So we can, we've learned through our lockdowns that we can live with less. We've also developed a much stronger sense of community. Uh, people were looking after their neighbors, they were checking on friends, people were doing their own uh, security patrol checks. You know, we really pulled together as people during the pandemic. And it also showed us a sensitivity to our environment. So uh, you, Johan and I were, were having this chat uh, before we started this call about the logistics issues 
globally, if anybody's in import or export, you'll know the cost of containers has gone up anywhere from 100 to 300 percent, and your timings has gone from anywhere from six weeks to 18 weeks, uh, depending on where you're shipping from and to. So what's happened is we've turned local. So local design and craftsmanship is becoming a, grow, a growing trend, and I am absolutely all for this. Also, our governments need to restore, need these people, the craftsmanships, the trade, to help restore uh, our economies that have been hammered by, by COVID. So hopefully giving those benefits, you know, hopefully the government is going to help those, those, those local craftsmen with local production at the expense of unsustainable items that we've become too reliant on. It's made in China. And I say this sitting in China, and believe me, China is the one giant consumerist as a society. So we need to look locally in our own backyards. So people are starting to realize that we can't be dependent on China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, India in terms of product production. And it's just not sustainable and the costs are now starting to become exorbitant. So people are also starting to become a little bit more critical about the way they dress their spaces or decorate their spaces. So we, we're moving away from this very sort of throwaway culture in terms of furniture, I have a couch for you and, and then I throw it away. And they're going and they're looking for more high quality or more individual items that are appealing. So I think and I, and I hope that we're going to see a shift back towards investing in once off pieces made locally, good quality, high use pieces. And that will hopefully help our, our local economy as well. Earth tones. So earth tones is an interesting one for me. I'm not an earth tones person, so I, I needed to get my head around this a bit, but I understand where it's coming from. So earth tones is very popular globally, but particularly in environments like South Africa, where we have a lot of access to outdoor nature because we take our cue from our outdoors. And sometimes, uh, depending on the, the earth tones, they can be a little bit dated and boring, you know, but if you start having a look at your burnt oranges, terracotta, muted greys, your mossy greens, I'm going to come to green very shortly, and yes, even that dreaded beige or greys, those are actually quite comforting colours if you think about them. They, a lot of them come from the warmer side of the colour wheel, which is a little bit more embraceive and comforting and people are looking for comfort in, in their living spaces. They're looking for nests to hide away from the big bad world at the moment. So you are seeing a lot of earth tones coming through. So it's uh, one of the reasons a lot of natural type floor finishes like tiles are very popular, your wood looks, your, your sandstones, anything that looks like some form of earth. So your organic materials such as your wooden side tables, your reclaimed wood piece of art, all of um, the, the textiles and the floor and wall finishes are starting to have these warmer tones in it. And I did do a little bit of a sneak peek today. I wanted to see if Pantone had released their 2022 color of the year. They haven't yet. I'm waiting with, with bated breath to see what it is. But it'll be, be quite interesting to see if it is an earth tone based on, on this trend. Fun and funky bathrooms, one of my absolute favorite. So we went through a stage where, where kitchens got sort of very tired and, you know, we'd done brown and we'd done the all white and we've done the bit of black. But bathrooms now, we're starting to focus on those uh, and using those as places of expression. So things like dramatic mirrors, uh, uh, snazzy wallpapers, a bit of zhuzh, something cool, chic, anything like that is going down really, really well at the moment. So it could be in your own uh, home, your guest loo, for example, dimly lit restaurant bathrooms, intimate lounge powder rooms, any of those sorts of spaces are starting to become quite fun and funky. And it's, it's, a, it's a place to escape, your guests to escape, you to escape. And it's, it's, it's transporting us from what is home and pandemic to places that are a little bit more maybe Mykonos or Ibiza or something that's a little bit more uh, interesting than where we are at, at the moment in terms of the world.
Then there is green, 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 and green. So whether it is olive green, bottle green, sage green, moss green, emerald green, sap green, just green. Any form of green is exceptionally popular at the moment. So the popularity of, of nature's most ebullient uh, uh, color has expanded past, you know, sort of grass uh, juices and kale chips and ever. And it's now in our walls, our cabinets. Yeah, for a like this, from steam for construction, you obviously want to engage the, the projects you are working on and the questions you may have technical or otherwise. That Thank you. So cabinetry, textiles, furniture, uh, finishes such as tiles in any working, uh, living or playing space, you are going to see green happening. And on that note, greenery. So if you had spent quarantine inside a flat or a small apartment or a very small townhouse, everybody was desperate for some access to, to greenery, be, be it a small garden, be it a balcony, half an hour outdoors leaning out of your, your window. Everybody craved that degree of outdoors. So all things related to gardening or outdoors is making a huge comeback. Anybody who's a landscaper on the call, this is your time. Together with new ways to incorporate greeneries inside our homes. So vertical gardens or indoor gardening is booming. As, and so it's a way to bring nature indoors, but it's also a way to reduce our stress and to improve the air quality inside our homes. And this leads me to uh, my, my, my next uh, trend, which is biophilic design. So biophilia, the love of nature and our ability to bring it into our living spaces and reconnect it is becoming a real necessity rather more than just a trend. So biophilic design started off as a trend and it was hovering in the background a little bit. And as a couple of things have happened. Our, econ our economies have faced challenges. Our societal structures have ch uh, faced challenges. And then the pandemic happened. Biophilic design did this. It, it literally skyrocketed. So it's a huge design trend. We run a completely separate course on, on biophilic design now. And it's gathering steam in, and making its way into commercial as well as residential spaces. So the trend incorporates natural elements, materials, light, vegetation, movement, anything from a, a, a vegetation wall, rattan, uh, coir rugs, stone and woodlock tiles, green plants, anything that creates a calming environment as well as oxygenating a room. There needs to be a health benefit to it as well to, for it to be true biophilic design. So home was always somewhere we lived and in recent times, We've actually lost connection to, to what home used to do. It sheltered us and uh, it protected us. Homes became, or our, even our offices, became spaces to, to show off or bases that we would come to home to where we, when we weren't somewhere else uh, socialising. And that all changed in, in the last two years. Our homes and our offices became places of sanctuary. And it all, all of this underscores that really profound importance of design, not just about the surface that we're doing, but also about the function and the meaning as well as the health benefits of it. So COVID brought a lot of bad news to, to a lot of people around the world. And there are still enormous hurdles and challenges to face. But throughout history, pandemics have actually had a substantial effect on the, and, and they've actually bent the arc of our societies. So for example, um, the rise of Christianity, believe it or not, was brought about by um, a pandemic. It was the fall of the Roman Empire, which was a pagan empire, which led to, to Christianity that was driven by a pandemic. Free labor was driven by a pandemic. Technological innovation, as well as the growth of the middle class was all um, they all came about as very good changes in our society as a result of pandemic. So there is good news coming. Some days it might not feel like it, but it's it's onward and upward. There's there's things to be grateful for. So some some of the top line things that are are coming out of of COVID are people have a greater awareness of health. 
So 62% of people said in a recent study, they've made significant lifestyle changes to sleep, exercise, sleeping patterns, and that can only do us good. We will be better parents, better partners, better uh, employees, better employers, if we have greater um, and better designers, if we have greater awareness of, of our health. Collaboration is up. There's a dramatic rise in productivity, design, innovation. There's new things coming out. Expertise is now being crowdsourced. There's adoption of new ideas and technology is being accelerated because we're sharing ideas. People are becoming more comfortable with a greater range of digital access, uh, the tools that we use being tracked uh, in terms of our temperatures, where we've been, what's happening with COVID. And it's raising our confidence in terms of how a technology can integrate into our, our daily lives. New occupations that we never thought about. You know, a biophilic design specialist uh, is starting to emerge as industries combine and merge and, and collaborate with each other. And probably most importantly, we're starting to think as a we, as a species. You know, we went, we've gone through a good period of our society where we eyes, and now we're starting to think of we's. For, so, for example, India and New Zealand are buying vaccines for neighboring countries who can't afford them. Not everybody has the, the benefit of a, a, budget, a, 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 a country budget to develop vaccines. So there is definitely good news coming out. So, so post-pandemic, you know, we're going to live in and work and play in healthier spaces, hopefully, and it's up, up to us to, to drive the change. But it's only going to be healthier in the places that we live, work and play if we shift our priorities and we help each other as well as the planet. And that is me for you tonight. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something new. I hope I inspired you, and I hope I showed you what, what is to come. Thank you very much, Melanie. We really appreciate your time. It was uh, very fruitful. I'm sure um, we'll all take something from your presentation. And definitely some trends to look forward to next year. Um, Absolutely. I must admit, you know, green 